Hello, and welcome to Raising the Bar with the MBBA. I'm your co-host, Adiola Adejobi. And I'm Jason Clark, president of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association. The MBBA is the largest association of predominantly African-American attorneys in New York. Our goal is to advance equality in the pursuit of justice, assist with the professional development of our members, and address legal issues affecting New Yorkers. The goal of Raising the Bar with the MBBA is to foster a substantive conversation about justice issues in our community and to try to identify a couple of solutions in the process. Today, we're going to discuss predatory lending. Joining us now is Gabriel Yomi Dabiri, shareholder at Polsinelli, as well as Boma Prega Julius, an associate at the Northern Law Group. So I'm glad we're taking this time to talk about uh, predatory loans. I mean, it's something that seems to affect a lot of our communities. And even if we just think back to the, uh, uh, to the recession we had um, previously and how subprime mortgage crisis has played a role in it, you know, when we're talking about loans, it's important that we learn exactly how we can be able to, you know, make the right decisions. But, you know, to give a little bit of context, um, Boma, maybe you can start by telling us a little bit about what exactly a predatory loan is. All right, so generally, predatory loans are any loan in which they are procured by coercion, um, deceit, uh, the person is unfamiliar with the terms. This is not the normal process for when you are seeking any form of lending. It should be very informative, very like direct, and very clear as to the terms because this is something that you are signing on to for a number of years. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, I mean, uh, that's a perfect explanation, really. I always break it out into two parts, which is on the front end, whether there is coercion or desert to trick you into going into the loan, or on the back end, uh, where the terms of the loan are just uh, more advantageous to the lender or unduly advantageous to the lender to the detriment of the borrower who's taking out the loan. Um, this subject is actually very personal to me, only because um, my mother passed away eight years ago. And growing up, we lived in a house and we never knew uh, or familiar with what the financial situation was with my parents. Most parents keep that from their kids. But we did know that there was a period of time where we lost control of our home. Um, and so we went from a period where we owned and had a mortgage and then we were paying rent and we did understand that much. Mm -hmm. Well, after my mother passed, we were going through her things and I happened to stumble upon her mortgage note, which was uh, in her bedroom. And at this point, I had already started my career as a finance attorney in, in the city, so I was familiar with what terms were typical in a, a loan agreement. So I was pretty shocked to read the terms that were in my parents' loan agreement. I mean, the interest rate, and this really sticks out in my head, was 19.6%, oh, wow. uh, which is a credit card right. interest rate that you, right. would, that you would see, not something that you would typically see in a mortgage loan. Mm -hmm. There are all these prepayment penalties and upfront fees just peppered throughout the document. And I remember thinking, how can my parents who are so educated fall victim to something like this but it just goes to show you know they they fit in two categories and I know we'll touch on later who are the targets of predatory lending but they were immigrants who had just come from the country they were um, both African American obviously uh, and as a result of that their options coming across as immigrants with probably limited credit history would have made them difficult for them to obtain a loan um, from a lot of different providers they, I think in many cases people think, oh, I'll just find a way to make this work. Right. Um, but the results can be quite disastrous. So once I experienced that myself, you know, very recently I purchased my own house and I really beat up my lenders throughout the entire process. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little bit of payback for, you know, with my parents, but I was a very difficult client, but I wanted to make sure that all of the terms that I had in my loan were advantageous to me and my family and not just for the day that I signed the loan, but going on into the future. Right. Well, can I just add something there? Just to give people a general picture as to the interest rate compared to other interest rate, a regular bank loan for a home is usually between 4 to 6%. So 19% is double plus more. Um, anybody with a credit history most likely will cre uh, qualify for a loan in that range. Um, however, if you don't have credit history, obviously it will be higher, but not necessarily that high. Um, and you have to, it's give and take, right? The bank is loaning you money, so they have to believe that you're able to pay back said money. Um, so your credit score affects their determination as to that. Um, this doesn't mean that every loan that you're offered is necessarily a bad or a good loan. However, there are 
things that may occur that may give you the impression that this may not be, you know, a normal experience. And you'll know, um, when my clients come into my office, usually when they're telling me stories, I'm like, yes, my expertise is the law and how to practice in it, but usually any human has a gut feeling. So when you're approaching this situation, if you don't feel comfortable, if you don't feel like this is going right, if you feel like in your stomach you're not getting enough information, there's probably something wrong. And that will give you an idea of what the basis are. And uh, Yomi's story, 19%, most people will have a gut reaction to that. Yeah, and that uh, makes a lot of sense. And especially, I've, I've also heard some stories about how, you know, people also tell you maybe to lie on the loan or say something mm -hmm. like, you know, especially maybe if you work for yourself, you know, kind of embellish who you are, what you do, not realizing that, um, you know, while that may help get the loan, it can lead to like deleterious effects for you later on. Um, but one thing you had mentioned, uh, Yomi, is that, uh, uh, you know, your parents, you know, when they're having this loan, that um, they were um, they were immigrants yeah. and they didn't know exactly what was um, really being signed. Um, Boma, would you say that there's, uh, who, who would you say really are the targets historically of, uh, of predatory loans? So, uh, obviously, um, there can be some kind of racism because of the history of the country, but most of the time they're looking for people who are uninformed, people who have some kind of like financial history that may not be that strong, um, and just general uh, lack of information. So you're looking at the elderly, you're looking at very young people, you're looking at people who probably work for themselves, small business owners, people who don't have high incomes, um, even people who have high incomes. You, it, it just depends on, I guess, like the person-to-person -person interaction and personal history, who they believe that they can trick and who they can deceive into doing these things. Um, obviously, as a person who is purchasing a home of any type, you should do your research before you even come to the table. So most of these bad actors know when you haven't done your research because there is just general information that everybody knows when they're purchasing a home and particularly when they're seeking lending. Um, what kind of information they'll have to produce to the banks, what kind of things that they should be able to talk about in terms of interest versus like, am I single, you know, marital status, all sorts of things. So there are definitely particular people that we are looking at in terms of like protection. So elderly, um, young, uh, I would say, people of color, particularly black people, are susceptible to these practices because um, they can come off as racist um, in the sense that they believe that you're uninformed. I, I, just to kind of hop on to that a little bit, there are two kind of categories, really. One is the vulnerable and uh, the other are hopes, and those are the two things that these predatory lenders really rely on. One of the common tropes that you hear uh, within the country is, you know, to be a part of the American dream, home ownership is a key aspect to that. Not everyone is a, in a position financially or otherwise to be able to afford a home. So what is particularly sinister about the approach that a lot of these predatory lenders uh, take is they create kind of a dream for certain people who may not be... Um, financially right in the best place to be purchasing uh, a loan. So some of the practices that you mentioned in terms of inflating income or lying about assets or uh, employment history, it can come off to a victim of a predatory loan of, oh, wow, this person's really trying to help me out. They're just trying to, you know, get me this home that I really want, not realizing that ultimately you know, they may not be able to own that home for very long. Uh, even if you enter into a loan that has a reasonable interest rate uh, within the range that Pomo mentioned, Often these are teaser rates, and after a period of time, they jump up to very high rates, and that was quite frequent during the financial crisis, where people didn't realize that their um, payments would double or triple, and then all of a sudden they find themselves in the position they can't keep up their payments, and then they're being kicked out of their homes. Definitely those type of things. Uh, people not being familiar with the fact that uh, the payment cycle should be disclosed up front. So you have uh, cycles of years, so 15, 30-year loans are the conventional loans. You most likely will see a 30-year loan if you're a young buyer or in the middle age. Um, 
the closer you are to elderly, of course, the bank does wants to shorten the amount of time that you're liable to them. So you'll see more 15-year loans. Um, particularly like payment schedule, you want to see quite an even increase or decrease in the payments of a mortgage. You don't want to see low payments on the front end and then particularly high payments on the, at the end because that means it, uh, not necessarily that ballooning is a bad thing, and um, we're going to rewind. Ballooning is that effect. You have low payments at the beginning, then you have high payments at the end of the life of the loan. Uh, you want to see the even payments because typically people's salaries increase over time, and then they'll decrease when they're ready for retirement, depending on when they are purchasing this home. Sometimes a balloon payment may make sense because somebody is in the flipping industry, that they're going to flip this house. They're not keeping it for the life of the loan. They're going to sell it off before the loan matures. Um, so it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's something to watch out for if you are planning to live in the home for the life of the loan, or this is like your forever home, or a home that you're not particularly looking to get rid of in the next few years. You want to keep the payments as affordable as possible because that balloon kind of creates a situation where you may have to sell or end up in foreclosure. Right. I was going to say, and so what are some of the warning signs that people can, can look out for um, if they're being approached with a predatory loan? Well, uh, a few good examples are any loan offer that's being made over the phone or verbally, because those are actually against the law. The uh, loan offers are supposed to be in writing. Uh, if they are uh, guarantees that you'll be actually given the loan up front before there's any sort of questioning as to what your financial history is, your employment history. And then similarly to that, no real interest in whether you have an employment history or, or uh, the financial means to be able to pay the loan back. Anything that sounds too good to be true is another uh, big one. If, if you come across a situation like that, um, you know, you should be very wary and stay clear. For your audience members, I think it's important for them to know that ultimately, even though a loan language legalese can seem very intimidating and daunting, that is no reason for them to enter into any sort of agreement that they don't fully understand. And there are a kind of uh, non-for-profits and charities that are out there who are, who are available to provide information and can explain anything that's unclear. And from the borrower's perspective, the potential borrower's perspective, if they're having a difficult time either understanding the terms of the loan or they're not getting straight answers from whomever they're speaking to, that should immediately throw up a red flag and they should utilize those resources to make sure that they fully understand what they're getting into with the loans that they're signing. And if someone's a victim of, or they think they're a victim, or whether they're family, friend, whoever, like what is something that they can do? I think it depends on when you're like finding this out. Closer to the beginning of like signing the loan, obviously there are some things that you should do when you're looking to sign a loan. Make sure the person is licensed, that's first and foremost. Anybody who um, is providing a loan must be licensed in the state of New York. Uh, and that's easy to check by going on to some of the state websites, like the New York State Department of Consumer Affairs, the Department of Financial Services. They regulate mortgages here in the state of New York. Um, with that, I would say complain to them right away. If something doesn't sit well, you should definitely make a complaint. Because these bad actors act in dark places, and unfortunately, until enough people bring it to light, um, state agencies as well as prosecutors are unable to go after these people. The second thing, which is very prevalent in private practice, is that there is something called the statute of limitations. Statute of limitations, particularly for contracts, is only six years. So if you're talking about this after that six-year period, it would be very difficult for you to set up your defense that you were tricked, bamboozled, and that you did not get the right information as past the deadline. And particularly, people end up doing this because of the situation Yomi said earlier, which is, I think I can do it. I think I can do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to keep this going. And they get years down the line past the statute of limitations, and they're in foreclosure and saying, I was tricked. And it's very difficult, once you're in foreclosure, to defend. 
We saw a spike in foreclosures in the 2013 to about 2017 period, and this is coming off of the Great Recession of 2008. So all of those foreclosures, you only had two options. You either ended up uh, with a notice of sale on your door, which means the foreclosure ended and you had no way of fighting this foreclosure because even though predatory lending might have happened, it was just too late. Right. The second thing is um, your other option is a home, mo a home loan modification and it, it depends on your finances, it depends on your ability to pay, and you get the balloon situation because now the bank is just modifying a very high loan and they'll just put the payments to make them affordable for you again. They're just putting like high end payment at the end. So you're having a situation where we're just kicking you losing your house down the line. And yes, it keeps your house, but ultimately it doesn't help you to retain this asset that you invested in. Um, I think more people need to just be aware from the beginning and particularly in these vulnerable communities, you have these issues in which people are always too late. Um, it's much harder to fix something once it is down the line versus like right when you're buying, I can tell you, you can come into a law office or anywhere and they will tell you what these terms should be, what the amortization schedule, which is what your payments should look like for the life of the loan should look like. Um, so that if there are red flags, you know from the beginning and you're comfortable, even your first time home buyer, like nonprofits or even law offices should be able to point to you the interest rate Make sure you're comfortable. Ask you questions like, are these payments okay? Can you afford this ongoing? People are so quick to want to buy because that's what you're supposed to do at a point in your life right. that they just are uncomfortable saying, hey, okay, so 1200 is actually a little bit too high for me per month. Maybe this loan uh, you know, terms may not work for me. There are other options out there. There are like things that people don't know, like FHAs or other loan options that may be affordable, but because people feel like they must get their loan from the conventional banks that they use, right. they are afraid to speak up. Yeah, and that's, um, you know, that, that's the thing too. I mean, I think sometimes there's some, um, uh, a misunderstanding of like who the the lender is uh, and that's because I think sometimes people think like yes maybe they're trying to help us in some type of way but they wouldn't um, you know agree to this loan if they didn't think that you know we could be able to pay it mm -hmm. but I know a lot of times what happens is you know it'll that loan can be uh, transferred to someone else or that loan officer may have just getting X amount of money and then that loan is being passed on somewhere else. So they don't really care. They just want to make sure that they got their cut in the beginning. Um, but that actually brings us to um, uh, another point. So let's say you do know someone who seems like they've been um, the victim of a predatory lend. Like what, what should you do to help that if you have a family member or a friend or someone else who's maybe a victim of this? Uh, Yomi, you did find this out uh, when your mother died. Right. So how did you guys go about trying to solve this? What were some of the things you did? And then I can add. Yeah, I mean, more. at that point, it was it was too late. And I guess the, the, the key point in this conversation we're having now is you don't want to find yourself in the situation that we were in. I mean, the statutes of limitations had more than passed by the time that we had discovered what had been exactly. going on. Quickly, can you just um, quickly describe what statute of limitations are? Yeah, so basically where um, it, it's a, a concept in the law where you have a certain time frame in which to bring a claim if, if you've been wronged in some way, shape, or form. That's the easiest way to describe it. And depending on what the offense is will determine how long you have to actually um, make that claim. For contract disputes is what would um, be triggered by you know the pre a predatory lending scenario. That period is six years uh, before, and you have to basically make your claim within that six-year period. Otherwise, it'll be time barred by the courts, and you won't be heard, even if your claim is absolutely legitimate. So that six-year period, that six-year period um, had already passed in the case of my mom's situation. So there was nothing that we could do there. Uh, I 
touched on a couple of nonprofit and charitable organizations that help. I want to state one specifically. It's the National Foundation for Credit Counseling, which uh, your viewers can find on nfcc.org. Uh, it's a very easy website to use. You basically just put in your zip code, and then the website will generate all of the low-cost or free resources at your disposal. And that's nfcc.org. Absolutely, yeah. So, um, and I. I bring that up only because having grown up without a lot of means myself, um, and because buying a home or taking out a loan, generally, it just feels very daunting in terms of how much money you're going to need to pay. I think a lot of people in that situation will be re reluctant at the idea of going to an attorney. I can't afford an attorney. I don't, I, there's no way I can do that. So NFCC.org is, is incredible insofar as you're able to get access to free or very low cost legal advice. So you can bring their, your loan documents to wh whichever organizations are listed for your particular zip code in the area. And they can actually tell you, the, you know, these provisions are, are not to your benefit or you should go back and push back on X, Y, and Z within the agreement. So given that the resources are there, there's no real reason for you to find yourself in the position that a lot of people are in. Quite frequently, they're in that position because they're just not asking enough questions or they don't know where to go. Um, another piece of advice I would give is to make the lenders compete or at least get a second offer from someplace else so that you can kind of sense, uh, do a, a sense check of the offer that you've received from the lender to find if you're going to more than one lender, one would like to think that there would be a divergence there and, you, and you'll be able to either get the best offer or at least be able to tell if an offer that you're being provided is just outside the box and ultimately going to do you more harm than good in the long run. Yeah, and I think, Boma, you actually brought up a really good point because when the payment terms uh, start to change, you know, for some of these companies, it, it, it's very clear that they can set up, they can set it up to where the payment terms change after the foreclosure, I mean, after the, um, the statute, the statute right. of yeah. limitations, so that then you're all, you're in foreclosure and you really don't have any other options. And so I know um, you brought that up, and I'm not sure if you know, but um, what are some of the defenses that people may have if, if they're in foreclosure? Yeah, see, this is where it's difficult. Foreclosure is the bank's right, right? So it's the bank's right to um, take back the collateral, which is the home, to sell to retain their money. It's very difficult at that point to undo that, unfortunately. And that's where my office is now, because your few defenses, you can still say predatory lending. Um, there are a number of federal laws and also state laws that give you that defense if it is truly predatory lending. Um, and it depends on the judge because uh, foreclosure actions happen at the state. Um, so some judges may entertain it if the evidence is egregious enough that you were tricked into signing this loan. Um, so it is worth saying if you have a particularly high interest rate, um, if you went through some kind of third party versus like a commercial bank, um, or if there are particularly like weird instances in which you procured this loan. I think another defense may be um, lack of understanding as to the loan terms, that information that should have been disclosed to you per the federal law Truth in Lending Act um, should have been disclosed and were not disclosed. So you didn't know the full terms of the loan even though you signed it in the beginning. Um, there are also just, again, modification at this point. Um, depending on your finances, you may refinance with another commercial bank to buy out the previous loan. I think we're at the tail end of the Great Recession's predatory lending. Um, but something I did want to say uh, that uh, we're talking about it in the home buying or the home loan, but there are other predatory loans that everybody should be aware of. Um, one of the most common one is the payday loan. Um, that is truly a predatory situation because they're taking advantage of people who do not have the ability to go to their bank or wait for loans. Um, small businesses run into predatory lending a lot um, because they need it to get their merchandising going and they are not able to get a commercial loan or obtain lending or some kind of financing in other places. 
So these are the type of loans that, again, you should know the terms up front. If you don't know the terms, um, there is something wrong. You should know how much the interest rate is. You should know if you can afford it from the beginning or not. Um, and if you don't, then yeah, these are, you, st you have to start taking the actions and start like fighting. But foreclosure, that's the end. That, it's hard at that point. Right, and so I was going to say we only have a few a minutes left. Of seconds, <laughs> we only have a few maybe, minutes left. Yeah. But um, you know, I think one thing people should also uh, think about and consider is just because it is a reputable bank or right. what you consider to be a reputable bank or a reputable bank period, that doesn't mean that you should just let them run the process and you not also know the terms because there were a lot of companies that were involved and got a lot of lawsuits around um, predatory lending. But with these last two minutes that we have, we would love to hear um, some of your final thoughts uh, for our view. For me, one of the, my final thoughts would be what Jason mentioned before, which is the mindset of this person wouldn't be making a loan to me if, if I didn't have the ability to pay it back. That is absolutely not true. I mean, uh, reputable banks do make a profit from homeowners who don't default on their loans because they get the benefits from interest and, um, and other fees that are legitimately sourced. For the predatory lender, uh, they get an outsized return if they can just take your whole house. <laughs> so right. just because you're dealing with the lender um, and your thought process is, well, if I pay it back, you know, or clearly this lender wants their money back, um, they wouldn't be making this loan to me if I didn't have the ability to pay them back. I would dispense with that uh, misguided thought. There are other ways that predatory lenders can profit quite richly off of your um, lack of understanding of the loan that you're getting into, and that's probably what I would leave with uh, your viewers. Yeah, we live in a world where information is accessible for most. On your phone, at home, it's better to do all of your research before you sign any papers. Call as many people as you can. Uh, the people you're working with should be willing to answer all of your questions. If at any point you feel like information is being withheld, then it is being withheld and go with that and move on and find whatever other contact that you need to find. Because ultimately, it is your responsibility and your finances that this loan is based in. So you have to do what's best for you. Right. Protect self first. Be annoying. Be yeah. Annoying. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Be annoying, but have your but ends up having your house. Exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And so thank you all so much for being here. And thank you for watching Raising the Bar with the MBBA on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. See you next time. Bye.